All right, man, you got a Bible or uh, you, I don't, I'm not going to be able to, you know, have it up on the screen or anything, but if you got a Bible or you just want to listen, that's great. Uh, but we're going to be in the book of James and we're going to, we're in uh, chapter one, second kind of a section of this. Let me just kind of bring up speed about what's happening, what's going on. James is the, what we call the half brother of our Lord, right? Jesus uh, was born of Mary as virgin. And then the, as Joseph and Mary began to have children together, James was the next in line. And so James is one of the Jesus half brothers, we call it. And so he did not really believe that Jesus was uh, the, the Messiah, that he was the chosen one, the promised one until after the resurrection. So he came kind of to believe after that. Um, but he sounds, of all the writers in the New Testament, he sounds the most like Jesus. Uh, so he obviously was paying attention to everything Jesus said, whether he believed it or not. And, um, and so uh, he began to pastor, James did, the church that, that began to assemble in Jerusalem. So if there is a first pastor, so to speak, it would be James. And he was charged with taking those new believers and making sure that they followed that is the, the thing that God wanted them to follow in the words of Jesus. And so what we hear here is James writing a letter because the church began to go through a tremendous deal. There was great division, and I know it's a review, but I just want you to hear it. There's great division between those who did not believe Jesus was the Messiah and those that did. And so these were called the way, and the Pharisees who didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah, they hated him. And so it was great persecution that was taking place. So if you came to Christ right away, uh, you were going to, to lose your business. You were going to be persecuted. All, nobody was going to participate with you. You'd lose mom, dad. There was great division that took place. The persecution was so great that people began to flee, right, as refugees would during hard times. And so... Uh, in that area of Jerusalem, then, the church began to move out and about. They just began to scatter, to get away from the persecution to find life. And so they made their way to different areas. And Paul, you, you know, as he did his journey, uh, he, he found some of them in different places. So they landed in, in Turkey, and they landed in other issues. And, and, and so you, you can see them everywhere. Asia Minor is what we call Turkey, or back then it was. And so you would see these uh, believers pop up everywhere. Well, James, being a compassionate a disciple of Jesus and, and wanting to really reach these people began to, he wrote a letter. It's called, and it's James. And it says, here it is, James, a bond servant of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes who were dispersed abroad, right? So all the Jews had scattered, the believing Jews had scattered. And so uh, James is simply writing them a letter just to let them know about life. Now, in this letter, I, I call it living out loud because really what's happening is we, they knew, for the most part, the Jews, they, they, they listened to Jesus, they, they understood him. It wasn't that they didn't know, it is that what was happening on the inside wasn't translating to the outside. That, that ever happened to you, right? You, you know what you ought to do, but on the outside, you're like, I ain't doing that, right? And this is where he is. In fact, Paul, when he writes, makes a similar statement. He says, man, he said, those things that I know that I shouldn't do, I know in my head I shouldn't do them, man, those things, it's like I'm drawn to that. And those things that I should do, I find myself not really energetic to do those things. And so what we believe is happening in the book of James is that he is calling us to remove the hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is when you know what you ought to do and you live something else, right? And so, so we don't want to be hypocritical Christians, right? We, we want to be tr true through and through. And so our goal is to live out loud on the outside what, what we already know to be true on the inside. And so this is where he's going, and this is what he's saying. And so last week we looked at trials, right? And so I'm just going to read it, and, and then we're going to make a real quick review and then jump into because they flow together. He says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, right? So we know that trials come at us, right? That's not a mystery. All of us go through difficult seasons, difficult times, right? And various means some are little, some are big, right? Uh you know, some some of us are, have have had friends and loved ones who are going through cancer and things like that. We we would consider those big trials. Those are life changing, life altering kind of things, right? And then there's just the thing that you know, my car's broken, right? Not that there's not, not that that's a devastation, but at the same time, it's not equal to to the other. They're various trials, right? And so, but they mean Matt, they mean something to us. And so, I'm not diminishing those at all, right? Uh, I mean, you, you know what it's like, you, you know, you stuff your toe, your whole body feels that, right? You could consider that a little thing, but is that that little when it's your toe that just got stubbed? And so this is kind of what we're talking about here. And so he says, Hey, consider it joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. 
and let that endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. No, what he's telling me here is, listen, trials are going to come, and there's a right way to respond to those, and there's a wrong way to respond to those. And so normally what happens when the trial comes, uh, we tend to have an emotional reaction, right? Trial comes, you get mad, you get angry, right? That's one of the first things I do. Some some trial comes and I get mad, or I get emotional and I get teary-eyed, right? I mean, I'm like, you know, when you hear the news that, hey, some, somebody you love has cancer, there's just, all of a sudden there's some, you, you're not thinking, you, rationality is like over here, and all of a sudden these emotions come out. And you start thinking about those things. And that's our normal inclination. Now, we're going to see in a minute that that's usually what gets us into trouble. That's why he says you know something, right? Consider it all joy, my brother, when you encounter various trials. Why? Because you know something. This is what we try to drive into our mind uh, last trials come, but we don't react like the world knows. We know things, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute in review. But but what happens is when a trial comes, we normally look for a shortcut, don't, don't you? Kind of a way out, right? Um, and and so sin will always offer us a shortcut to those things, and and we'll we'll find that we'll end up doing that. And James is saying, let's don't do that. Let's let's we we know things. Let, let's let's don't let's don't get distraught, act like the world. Let's don't get stupid. Let's don't do things and work out of emotion, right? And uh, I don't know why the story came to my mind, but we were, Tammy and I were, uh, I think it was this week, we were out riding around, and we ended up, uh, I, I got off the interstate and went over to East Lake Park. We hadn't been to East Lake Park in forever. And uh, it, we grew up there, though. That was that was actually where I asked Tammy to marry me, and we took our kids, you know, played around there and everything. So we rolled into uh, East Lake and and uh, pulled up and, into uh, the area where they used to have the, the little paddle boats and all that. And, you know, we got out of the car and walked over there to the very spot that uh, that I asked her to marry me. But there's also a, a baseball field that's still there. It's right by the little creek that runs into East Lake Park. And uh, when I was probably – Eighth grade, I played baseball, so we practiced at that at that spot. I played first base, and the first base line is right by that water, and the ball was fouled off, and it went into the water. So I went to go get it. We had metal cleats back in those days, and so uh, and they had these little concrete uh, pieces that kind of held the water and quit the mud from sliding. And so I stepped on one of those to reach into the, wa into the water and get it. And just as I did, my cleat hit one of those mossy spots, and I slipped and I fell right into that lake. I mean, I'm, I come up looking like a monster. And I got green sludge hanging all over me. That's a trial, right? Unexpected, and I'm angry. My friend, and I feel sorry to this day, my friend Greg Tucker came over to help me help me come out of that water. I was so frustrated. wanted somebody to enjoy my misery. I pulled him in with me, right? And, I, and I'm like, I don't know why I did that. It was just one of those instincts. And so I'm looking at him and he's like, you know, what have you done? And I, and I, I didn't have an answer. I just knew that I hate to be, I just hated it. The, my pride in me just didn't want to be the guy that looked like the dork. And so it, worse than that now, I'm the pride who's just a jerk, right? And so uh, anyway, uh, I, I didn't have a chance to apologize to him time and time again. Uh, but 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 here, that's what happens. The trial comes, and we tend to want to want to get away from it as fast as possible. And that may be a silly story, but I don't know. It just came to me this way. Anyway, but we do that, don't we? Trial comes, and sometimes their first inclination is, well, I'll lie my way out of this. Right? I, that's, that'll work. Let me just lie. Or, uh, hey, I'll steal my way out of this. I, I, can, I can be creative. I can borrow some things from other people. Right? I mean, this is, this is, this is what can happen. Or, or, or we move into immorality. We just you know, figure out a way around it. And, and so last week, as we learned about these trials, we learned that we'd have to submit our emotions to what we know. This, this is where you and me have to go. And so I'm going to I remind you of the things that we looked at last week. Paul tells the Romans this, uh, that, that he says uh, concerning our deficits, all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to His purpose. This is a mystery of God, that He'll take something that doesn't look very good, and he will cause it to work for good in my life. Not that that thing is good, but he will cause it to work in my life for good, right? And this is what he says. It's a promise. So here's what I see. I see that every trial that comes my way may feel like a de deficit in my life, but God will use it as an asset in my life. Most of the lessons that we learn came through hard times, right? 
It's, it's the scars that we carry that really make us who, who we are. With, without hard times, without that rubbing, uh, there's, there's no real uh, maturing that takes place. Without gold being heated in fire, the dross is never moved off of it, so it gets pure. Without the grain of sand in the oyster shell, the pearl never develops, right? It's all of these things. Everything comes through that trial, through that toil, and through those things. But we can't let our feelings get in the way, and so we know things. So, so a trial comes, right? I mean, you know, you, you break a leg, or, or, or someone has cancer, or your car's not working, or you lost your job, or whatever those things are, it's easy to get emotional, but we know things. This is, this is, we, we, we believe this book is what it says it is. And if God says he will take all things and, and weave them together and for good in my life, I'm going to breathe a minute, right? I'm going to be, okay, I, I'm all right. I'm all right. Why? Because I know things. I'm not, I, I mean, it's easy to want to let my emotion get, get the best of me. Start finagling. We're going to talk about that. That's going to get us in trouble. But, but I'm not going to be that. I'm going to live on the outside of what I know on the inside. This trial that feels like a deficit, God's going to make an asset. I think if we took the time to start sharing stories here, you could tell me a lot of your deficits that turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened to you. And that thing that looked like it was terrible, you get to the end of your life and you look back and you go, if I could do away with everything, that'd be something I'd keep because it changed who I am, right? We all know that. We know it. And so the, when trials come, though, we have a tendency not to do that. And the, one of the other things we know uh, is we know that Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, had this thorn in the flesh. Something was eating at him, right? It was a weakness, and he didn't want it there. And so a lot of people believe it was his eyesight and his health. Uh, it could be a person. You have, how many of you have people that are, that are a thorn in your flesh, right? So it could be one of those things. And Paul prayed three significant times of prayer. Hey, I want you to deliver me from those things, right? Here's your trial. I don't want it. I want it gone. They pray. And he says this, and God said no. Sometimes our trials are meant to teach us a lot more than just silly things. And Paul says this, for God said, no, I'm going to leave that there, because when you are weak, then I'm strong. I want you to understand that my grace is sufficient for you, right? And so we know that. I know that sometimes God's not going to take something away from me. I'm going to carry that trial the rest of my life, right? You ever had that? There's a lot of things in my past. I carry it today. And there's a lot of things in my past people like to remind me of that I carry today. You got friends like that? Love to point out all the crap that you did in, your, in the past, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so, but, but here's, here's what, here's what I know that that's there for a reason. And, and, and it shows me that I'm still standing. God's gracious. Right. And so, so trials come and we're going to know it's an asset to a deficit. We know that sometimes he doesn't give me, I mean, a deficit to an asset. Let me get that right. Deficit to an asset. And sometimes uh, he's not going to remove that trial because he wants me to rest in him and to trust him as he produces that grace. And then there are certain times we just start going, hey, I don't, does God, is, where are you, God? Do you, even, do you even care? That's why right after Paul says all things work together, if you move right into, follow on to Romans 8, he says, what can separate us from the love of God? He reminds me that, hey, this feels like God's abandoned to me, but he hasn't. He loves me as strong today as he did before that trial happened. This trial isn't an indication, and I want you to hear this, that is not punishment in your life, right? God's no longer punishing you as a Christ follower because you have confessed your sins. Now, that may be a result of some of your stupidity, and I'm like, well, just don't diminish that. But that's not God going, oh, okay, you messed up, you didn't have enough quiet times, you didn't, have, you didn't pray enough, so here it is. No, 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 no. This is simply uh, God working things in our life, and so I'm going to know that God loves me and nothing can separate me from that love. Those are the things we know. Now, that's what we looked at last week. So then he says, hey, ask for wisdom. Listen, if you can't figure this thing out, this is what he says in verse five. At verse five. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without being mean to you. And, he, and it will be given. But if you ask in faith, don't doubt. For the one who doubts is like being tossed to and fro. Don't look for second opinions. If you ask God for wisdom and he gives it to you through his word or through people who come in contact with you, follow that wisdom, right? God's going to, you ask for wisdom. Hey, I don't know how to deal with this trial. Just get a, get a, just go somewhere in the quiet. Begin to pray and ask God to give you wisdom. I promise you'll do it. 
every time. He says, listen, if you don't, if, you, if, you get, if you're going to hedge your bets and you're going to start going, I don't know, I mean, I kind of like what, what he says here, but can, is, is, there, is there somebody else I can, is there another answer, right? And we begin to try and find the world to give me that answer. And he said, don't do that. You then become that person that's unstable in all their ways. You're just going to be tossed to and fro. You're all in with Jesus. So if he tells you, and you know what he says in your word, you do that. Because we trust him. All right, now, that was all last week. And that's the, that's kind of the skinny on that. Now, here's, this is where it gets interesting. Because he says, uh, we, we got all the way to verse 12. Blessed man who perseveres under trial. For once he's been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which has been promised. Listen, trials mature us and get us to the place where God wants us. It removes all the junk so that we're pure and genuine. And what we know on the inside, we're living out on the outside, right? You ever seen true believers go through trials and you go, there's no way you can be that content. There's no way you can be at that peace. You know what that is? What they know on the inside is finally making its way to the outside, right? That's the goal of all of us. And so this is what it is. And then he says this. No, now, um, verse 13, no one is to say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin has run its course, it brings forth death. Right? Now, every time there's a trial, Satan will go, hey, here's a shortcut. I got a, I got a shortcut for you. Try this, right? And so then we want to blame God for this. And that's what he's saying here. Listen, I... That, you, you chose to make a stupid choice? You, you chose to you live on your emotion? You chose to sin to see if you couldn't get around that trial? Don't blame that on me. That's on you. I didn't tempt you to do that. Right? Make sense? Because this is where we find ourselves now. Now, this is real. Because there are trials come, and you know, you know yourself. Two o'clock in the morning, you're plotting, and it ain't all holy. You're figuring out a way out of that trial. Right? You're gonna throw somebody else under the bus. You're gonna you're gonna just whatever sin that you can think about you do. None of us in here escape that. It's a reality, right? And so uh there there are no shortcuts in this in this whole thing. Um there's a verse that came to mind when we were doing this. Um let me see if I can find it real quick. No temptation has overtaken you except something common to mankind. Listen, you're not the first one to go through that trial, right? And he's saying, and with that trial, there's going to be over here a door that looks like I can take that door. And if I take that door, I don't have to deal with this trial, right? And so it's a temptation to get out from underneath all the mess. And he says, no temptation has overtaken you except his common demand. Listen, that, you're not the only one that has had the opportunity to go through that door. There are lots of others who have and did learn from them, right? But he says this, but God is faithful, so he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with that temptation will provide the way of escape so that you'll be able to endure. Listen, that's not the only option you have. There are times we think that, right? I mean, sometimes that temptation can be so strong. We, you, have you ever faced that? I mean, we can just talk about silly things, but uh, you know, Tammy, will, she's, she has this art of freezing everything. She freezes everything, right? Uh, one, she frees me out in the house, but that's a whole menopausal thing. Uh, but but, the, but the, the, the other issue is that, you know, we have food, so you can put it in the freezer. Now, I try to eat really, I mean, if you knew how disciplined I try to eat, I am like, I'm a, I'm a macro guy. I got the proteins, I got the carbs, I got the fats, I, I got them all percentage-wise and everything else. But there's going to be something that happens, usually on a Sunday afternoon. I want something sweet to eat. And that freezer out there has that stuff in it. And I'll tell myself, I ain't doing it. I am not doing it. And I'll go try and get some walnuts or some pecans, you know, and kind of satisfy. But I know what's going to happen. I'm going to go out there after she goes to get her shower. And so she won't see it. And I'm going to I'm going to unwrap one of those things. I'll put it in the microwave. And I'm going to woof it down before she gets out of the shower. And I'm going to go sit back down like nothing happened. It's just going to be there. I know it before I do it, right? And this is what I'm telling you. This is how we act in the Christian life. I, I know better. I know that... that that means everything I sacrificed all week, I just blew right there because I ate half a cake, right? I, literally, I can eat half a cake in about a minute. But, but anyway, uh, but, the, but those, are, those are the issues that, that come our way. And he's saying, listen, don't, no, 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 don't do that. And now I want to blame Tam. Well, if you wouldn't keep this stuff in here, I wouldn't eat it. But that's not, it's not her fault. 
I have a choice. And God always has a door for me to walk through, right? That, that's not temptation. Sin is not my choice. It's, it's, it's what Satan wants. It's what the flesh wants. It's what the world would, would say is right. But that is not letting me live on the outside what I know on the inside. And this is where I want us to come to. I always have a choice. James 1, and this is what he, this is what he says. Let me get back to it. Verse 13. Now each one is tempted. I don't say I've been tempted by God. For God does not tempt anyone. Sin is destructive every time we choose it. Every time we choose it. It never pays. It, it always pays. It, the wage is death, right? But it, but, but it never pays in, in good. So God's not in those things. I'm not, listen, worry is one of those things. It's not an option. That, that's not going to fix anything, right? But that's an emotion. That's what trials come. We, we begin to worry. We begin to, it's natural. All of us do that. Here's where we have to center ourselves and go, okay, well, look, let's look at what's real. You know, let's look at God and see how, how that situation that is really happening, how, how does God see it? That's where I want to get. I, I don't want my emotions. I, 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 want, I want to know what he thinks. My control freakness isn't going to fix my problem either. And I, God knows that's what happens in my world. My personality is, if something starts feeling like it's slipping out of control, I'm grabbing the reins. I don't care who's in charge, I, all of a sudden I am. I, yeah, you can ask the guys at work, you can go anywhere, right? That's what happens. And that is sometimes one of the most foolish things you can do because you aren't in control of those things. I'm in control of how I respond, but it's not my role to all of a sudden be master of this deal. I'm going to trust that God's going to do his thing. I'm going to wait for the waters to part. This is how it works. So, listen, my problem isn't the devil. My problem isn't the world. My problem is not others. My problem is my sin. Listen to what he says. But each one, verse 14, is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Right? My sin's my fault. My sin is my fault. Entice. That's, that's our evil desires. That, that's, that's these things. It's a trigger trap. Right? It's a, it's a bait. Right? Uh, every one of us has a sin that we know will snag us every time, right? Um, I mean, you, you look at a rat, you put some peanut butter on a, one of those little things or a slice of cheese or whatever, it's going to take that. At some point, it's going to take that bait, right? Uh, I was, I, this is an older story I remember reading about, though, but they had a real infestation of wolves in Alaska. This is a gross story, but anyway, that's what they did. In order to get rid of those wolves, they took a knife and they dipped it in blood, and they froze it, and they dipped it in more blood, and they froze it, and they dipped it in more blood, and they froze it, and they put it in the, in the, in the ground. Those uh, wolves were drawn to the smell of that blood, and they'd begin to ferociously lick that thing, getting the blood off, and they'd lick that thing until they just cut themselves, and they kept licking that thing, and they bled to death. That's a gross thing, but that's what happens to you and me. That's the picture of what happens when I choose sin, and I don't see the devastation of it, and I just keep, just keep I'm like in a frenzy, man. I'm, just, I'm all in that sin. You know what it's doing? It's slowly killing me. This is what he says here. This, this is exactly how it's, how it's working. This is a lure or a bait. Now listen to what it says. This is sin. He's telling us how does sin happen. Uh, this is the birds and the bees for sin. Not, not, not how to make babies, although it's similar. He's going to say, hey, two things come together, and, and sin is birthed. But this is what he says. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Right? So Satan knows that you have a, a trigger trap, right? Let us, the writer of the Hebrew says, let us lay aside the sin that so easily entangles. That definite article in front of that, the, means that each, it doesn't mean general sin, it means a specific sin, right? Let us lay aside that specific sin that we know will trip us up, right? And so for you, maybe it's addiction, maybe it's uh, worry, maybe it's lust, maybe it's lying, may, maybe it's stealing, whatever it is, we have to know that. And I have to know that that's a lure that Satan's going to use every time, right? I mean, how many people do you know, man? I mean, I got I got buddies, man. They they've been in uh, AA and and they've they've gotten their their uh, medallions and all of those things, and then all of a sudden it's one night, and and they fail, and and now they're starting all over again. I got one now, so he's two months into. Uh, rehab now after having been sober for probably two years, right? It just it happens, right? We we know that it happens to us too, right? I, I can you can never take a break from that sin and go ah maybe this time I, it won't be no stay away from it. 
So sin happens because you are lured into an option that's sinful, but man, it's that shiny thing. You know what I'm talking about? It's just, a, it's just that shiny thing, and it's sitting there, and you have to say, no, you can't go by your feels. It'll make me feel better. It don't matter about feeling. It's about knowing, right? And he says this, then when lust has conceived, that is, you're going to think about that thing, and it's going to keep dangling there, and there's, that's that option, that's that temptation. He says, and then when you, it's there, and you decide to embrace it, then lust is conceived. And when that lust is allowed to continue unfettered, what does it do? It gives birth to sin. And when sin has run its course, it, it falls into death, right? That's the process. That's the process. It will deceive you into thinking the action is justified. That's how we live our life. Oh, yeah. I, I, I didn't have another choice. That, that's all I had. No, 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 no. You had choices. That door that you chose was not the one. It was easy, and the whole world was pointing at it. But there's a one over here. God has always provided you a way out of that. Right, so what happens is, uh, my my desire, my emotion, right, kicks in. It convinces my brain to justify that, and then my will creates a plan. That that's how sin is birthed, right? There's an emotion attached to it, always. There's always an emotion attached to sin, right? It, we we just it is. It's either pride. Uh, I mean, you pick one. It's 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 all usually it's pride. That that's the, that's the emotion that's tied to it. You're embarrassed. You don't want people to see it. So here's what you do: you hide. That that pride, you will somehow convince your mind that it's the right thing to do. I can't tell me people I've I've heard that say they're going to get out of this marriage or do this thing because it just it feels right. Well, it's just it's just. Uh, God wants me happy. All of a sudden, in their mind, they've justified that this is the right course of action. It has nothing to do with facts. It has to do with feeling, and their mind was tricked by yourself to convince you that it's an okay thing to do, and then your will's plotting a plan. You're, now, now, all of a sudden, you're all in. That's how sin happens. It's exactly how it goes. Uh, the, the emotions convince the mind, and the mind uh, will get the, the, the wheels of, of the will in, in motion, and there it goes. So you have to keep your emotion in check and your mind in check. This is who we are, right? We don't we don't live by those things, by, by our emotion. We live by what we know to be true because we know things. So don't fall for that stuff. Then he says this, Don't be deceived, brothers and sisters. Every good thing, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation. You won't find good stuff in those foolish choices. The only good choice you find is in the Father of uh, of whom there is no shifting shadow and there's nothing but goodness that comes from him. You'll never find it down here in the shiny pit. You'll never find it going through those doors of temptation. You will always find it when you know what you know about that trial and aren't tempted and, and sidetracked by all the junk and you just you just trust and you wait. Every good gift comes from him. Quit settling. That's what he's saying in verse 18. In the exercise of his will, he gave us birth to the word of truth so that we would be like a kind of first fruits among all his creation, that, that we would enjoy the fruit of what this thing is called the Christian life. When uh, we're, I'm listening to a lot of football stuff about, about Alabama. <clears throat> but um, Alabama has this unusual practice. I don't know if other teams may do it, but they scout other teams, which is not unusual. But then they scout themselves, right? So they send scouts in to see how how Alabama plays football, even though they're the coaches, to see what the weakness might be in those certain areas that they are. That's how their defense gets better, not by scouting another team and, and mastering that, but learning what their, their, their deficit is in their own thing. And so if I have that thought, I think here's what we have to do. We have to do a better job of scouting ourselves, right? I have to do a job of what are my weaknesses? What what are those areas in my life that I'm prone to wander, prone to sin? Lord, I feel it, right? And I have to learn how to stay away from that. It's, it's the only way that we get out of these things. Anyway, that's the truth I wanted to bring to you today. Uh, man, this is this is good. This is this next week we talk about the tongue, and um, yeah, it's gonna be fun. So come on, hang out with us.